just want to welcome everybody and say hi on behalf of the Small Farms team for NDSU Extension um, and welcome to the Local Meats production for Farm to Market webinar series. So this is our first um, series on getting livestock ready for harvest. Um, just a couple things I wanted to mention um, is one, again, I just wanted to mention that pre-survey. There is a link in the group chat um, and I'll mention it probably in a little bit here too, but um, if you can go in there and click on that and take that, that would be um, greatly appreciated. I just wanted to mention a couple other things. Um, the small farms team with NDSU is a fairly new team um, within the last four or five years. And so one of the things that we just created, I know this is a different topic, but um, we just created a publication um, called Beginner's Guide to Raising Chickens. So I just wanted to put that out there just to give you guys that information. And then also keep in mind, if you are a grant writer, I am working on putting together a workshop for, for you guys. So basically it's a two day grant writing, um, one day um, and it'll probably be in like September and then another day, like four weeks later, maybe three to four weeks will be the second day. And on that first day, you basically, you take your proposal, you create that outline, you get all the resources you need to expand on that outline. And then on the second day, you basically take your proposal, look at it from the, re -role, from the role of a reviewer. Um, we'll give you some strategies um, for funding and provide you with um, the opportunity to um, finalize that to actually be able to submit it. So just keep an eye out um, for that because that is something that hopefully will be coming out this fall. Um, the recording link, yes, my goal is to have this to you by the end of the week um, as, a, as a recording and it will be up online. So you should be getting that by the end of the week as well. All right, so with that, um, thank you very much. Um, I know we have a couple polls, Travis, so just as a reminder, whenever you wanna do that, but I will just send it back to you to introduce who you got in your panel and take it over. Thank you very much, Lindy. And in fact, uh, she's been a linchpin in making sure that this happens. And this is the first of our five part webinar series. And so, uh, Lindy, I'm just going to provide a little bit of introduction. And what better way to uh, have that poll uh, as at the same time of when I'm talking, because we don't want to interrupt our, our talented presenters that we've invited to join us. And so one of the quick things that uh, when we describe um, what impact, let's see here, that we have, oops, that we can have um, on our livestock and our production is uh, I put together one main slide. And so hopefully you guys can see this of, uh, of just how do animals grow. And, and big picture, I guess, uh, uh, again, as, as we kind of evaluate and where we're at at North Dakota State University Extension is that it's not about lecturing anyway, and we, hopefully it's about discussion and interaction. So this is gonna be the max of, of my slides that we put together, but I think it tells the best story that we can in this, as we look at the bottom of our x-axis of this quick graph, we have live weight, and uh, that can be in any unit that we so uh, aspire to do. And in fact, I think one of the things that uh, that I'll take ownership in and and uh, allow us to, as we talk through these series, is that it is impactful that we're talking about beef cattle, that we're talking about swine, uh, that we're talking about sheep, and. And we're talking about goats. And in fact, if we have some of our more variety species, uh, we can at least reach out to people and see how we can be able to provide uh, something else as well. So uh, we have tissue weight going on the top. And the best way that I describe this, and in fact, again, we're at animals, but uh, even as we think about it from a young person of, uh, as you continue from age three to four to five to seven or whatever that is, is that you're going to grow and the bones are growing. And we know that. And in fact, of course, we've got CJ on here. And so in fact, his, uh, his bones grew quicker or faster than mine did because uh, he, he certainly made it taller, more vertical than, uh, than I did. But uh, at, genetics is going to allow you to a point uh, of when those bones are going to stop growing. And as we think about it from that standpoint, Additionally, you follow the yellow line, and as we think about it, you know, and as you move from grade school to middle school to high school, certainly there's more muscle. And as we think about it from a beef animal or a pig or whatever that may be, is that for the most part, that's going to linearly increase. The difference is, is that last one that is fat and adipose tissue, that's our green line. And when, in fact, as we look at that green line, 
uh, we think about it from growth plateauing. And so there's gonna be a time when those bones uh, and the, you reach or the cows or the pigs or the sheep or the goats reach mature frame size. And there's gonna be a time when we decrease or plateau in terms of that muscularity. Now, as we continue in terms of providing energy and providing protein and those feed resources, we should be well aware uh, that it's the fat that continues to move on, okay? And so we have those as, as options um, that, that we have in our supply chain of animals. And Lindy, do they have access to our um, poll? Uh, just to give you a, a little bit of heads up before we kind of move on is, uh, of course, we have this evening so with May 3rd, and then we will have May 10, May 17, May 24, and 31, as you see from uh, farmers markets approach, and then retail meats, and then consumer relationships, and then poultry, just to give you guys an idea of, uh, of things that are going. We'll share this back at the end uh, of ours, and I will stop sharing and offer that poll. Okay, and so um, how many people are watching with you and what would you consider today's level of experience uh, for today's topic, okay? And so you can give us just a little bit of an idea of how many people are there and what your experience level is. A couple of people that we have uh, that, are, that are here and that are joining us, okay? And Lindy gave that quick introduction. And uh, we have CJ and Callie Thorne uh, that have joined us. Uh, as well, and uh, can give a little bit of a background. Uh, Lisa Peterson works for NDSU Extension uh, and also has served as our Beef Quality Assurance uh, Coordinator. In fact, in a previous life, I got to work with her in that role and now enjoy the uh, opportunity of having her as a colleague. Mr. Daryl Lease. Uh, Daryl Lease uh, is joining us uh, particularly to provide some of his ideas and input uh, from a direct marketing of our swine industry. Of course, uh, my name is Dr. Travis Hoffman and serve as your extension sheep specialist for NDSU and the University of, of Minnesota. And in fact, we've also, uh, there on the, the video, we've asked Adam and, and April Mobby to, uh, to potentially give some ideas of what happens on their operation of, of Garden Dwellers Ranch as well. And so first off, I guess, uh, when we think about this of getting livestock ready for for harvest is that I would like each of our uh, panelists to provide just a little bit of input on, uh, on who you are, what your story is uh, before we kind of move into the deeper portions. And so Callie and CJ, I'm gonna open with you. What's your story? Hey you guys, thanks for having us on here tonight. So our story, right? How much do we share? Um, we're actually on my home place. This is where I originally grew up and stuff. And we've been on this place for, this is our family, 75 years now. We've always been a cow-calf operation and, and did more farming even when I was younger. But I think uh, relating to this really kicked off, what's it been, two years since COVID hit. And um, kids got kicked out of school like everybody else's. And I remember um, I was homeschooling, things were getting crossed off on my calendar, all the work that I was doing. And uh, CJ one night said to me that I think we should start selling beef. And I kind of just laughed at him and I didn't even respond, which was probably not nice. But I realized then that he was serious. And that's really kind of where it started. Uh, prior to that, I mean, we'd sell an animal or here, two or there, but we knew that if we were going to really ramp up and I mean, that's the time that fats were getting backed up. There was no meat on the shelves. Um, feedlots were getting backed up. Packers weren't buying. You know, it was just like the perfect storm. And um, and so within a week or two, I mean, we had all our paperwork submitted and stuff. And so that's kind of how we got rolling into this and um, have been sprinkling it in with everything else we do here. We, we do have a cow-calf operation still, a backgrounding feedlot, sell beef run some yearlings. I mean, we really kind of pivot with the industry is kind of how it works at our place. And um, so we'll we'll share more after a bit then. Lisa, would you provide a little bit of a background and what's your story, Lisa? My story. So um, I'm Lisa Peterson. I'm the Extension Livestock Specialist at Central Grasslands Research Extension Center near Streeter. I'm also the state's beef quality specialist. And you know, I, I joined NDSU 23 years ago um, in that role of being a beef quality assurance person. 
Um, grew up on a very diversified livestock operation in Southwest Colorado. Um, my granddad was one of the first cattle feeders in Colorado. In fact, he sold the first load of fat cattle um, through the Denver stockyards and the last load. Um, and so I, I've had a, kind of a long history in the beef industry, but I really like the meats business. And, you know, on the local side during COVID, I would get a lot of calls about people buying local meat that just wasn't very good. And what could I do about it? And, you know, it really brought to my attention that we needed to maybe go back and help producers remember how to, um, or learn, maybe they never knew um, how to produce finished cattle in particular. And we had done that training 20 some years ago at NDSU and maybe we actually need to bring that back. I think that's something for us to think about doing. So um, that's a little bit of my background. I'm very passionate about this business and you know, I, this local stuff's pretty exciting to me. And so that's who I am. And we ranch in South Dakota. So I have a Dakota's mixed marriage and live in North Dakota during the week. So my husband kind of tolerates me on the weekend. So. Thank you, Lisa. Mr. Daryl Lease, uh, what's your story? Oh boy. What's my story on huh, Travis? Well, I grew up on uh, a crop and livestock, a very diversified farm. Uh, we had, we grew small grains, uh, sunflowers, uh, a little bit of corn back when it wasn't popular to grow corn up in our area. But we had a lot of hogs my whole life, uh, a lot of beef cattle and a lot of sheep. Uh, currently right now, we still have the uh, family farm that I grew up on. Uh, my oldest daughter, her husband and my granddaughter just moved back and actually live at the farm now. And we continue a diversified livestock uh, farm slash ranch. Um, for a lot of years, going back probably 10, 15 years, I've had a desire to be in the retail uh, slash wholesale meat business. I uh, always wanted to do a self uh, integration, vertical integration, I guess. Uh, and so about two years ago, we had the opportunity to buy a little slaughter plant along with five other producers and started to really expand that. We did some for several years prior to that on a pretty small scale. And right now we are just trying to manage our growth because uh, some things have become a little bit overwhelming uh, on the growth side of things and managing that has probably become the biggest challenge uh, for us. And Right now, our, our main focus is still the hogs, but uh, our beef and lamb production is also uh, gaining actually considerable ground on our on our hog production. Thank you, Daryl. And in fact, uh, Adam and April, would you guys uh, give a, a little bit of an update? And of course, when Daryl talked about farm and ranch, at least we may, you got to make the designation because you go and, and sell yours uh, based on Garden Dwellers Ranch. Go ahead, Adam and April, if you want to unmute and tell a little bit about your story. Uh, yeah, so my parents had a culinary herb farm um, for about 20 years. Um, in 2019, I kind of branched out and wanted to get into the meat aspect of things. I'd been raising sheep for about three years prior um, kind of building my flock, building uh, up everything uh, genetics wise and, and meat wise, kept sampling my own. So in 2019, uh, I started selling uh, officially under Garden Dwellers Ranch and was doing pasture raised sheep as well as pasture chickens. Uh, in 2020, my wife April and I uh, married and we kind of just compounded everything that we had um, individually now that we're together um so we doubled our market pretty much as far as sheep sales and um the pastured chicken um been doing it since then and now we're actually combined with um selling herbs as well trying to sell a, a more complete package with the meat as well thank you okay so our first formal question goes to uh to cj and Callie, and uh i think uh, when we talk about it and again you you raise uh, certainly some of your cattle, but some of those also get incorporated into uh, your operation. And so, CJ, if you want to lead or Callie uh, of, of the description of what are the cattle that fit kind of your program and uh, what are the visual evaluators uh, that you can look at? Okay, well, 
Uh, we would have some of our own that we'd finish and the majority probably have been purchased. Um, whether they're short loads from guys that have cattle finished that don't fit um, with some contacts we have, but uh, I guess it would start with their, you know, finished weight and then frame size that if it can carry that weight. but generally it's that brisket look how deep they are in the brisket and if they're finished um, it's, it's definitely hard when you finish your own to try to hit that target weight and that date and slot that you have picked way out. But, uh, so it's a visual and, you know, almost be like the body condition score, but for a fat cattle, not, not on the cow side, but, um, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to get those, those weights and the butcher dates, I guess where our end would be, we have, uh, a guy that has a USD facility that has some high and lows and he, we communicate with each other and, and he can say, Hey, I probably would have some time for you guys in a couple of weeks. So then I would start making some phone calls and feelers. If some guys have some cattle locally program would be, obviously they're not, they're not antibiotic free, like as a calf, you know, if some guys have some all naturals, they get kicked out. They're still good, healthy cattle. Um, but they don't fit the all natural program. So I, when people call us, they're corn fed, you know, with roughage, whether it be a corn roughage silage or, or hay, um, you know, people are like, oh, are they all natural? No, I cannot tell you that they're all natural. They'll definitely be, if they had any antibiotic beyond that withdrawal, withdrawal date by a long ways. Um, and the hormones and stuff like that, I guess we, we generally don't, implant on any of our steers but it's not a deal breaker i guess but even when we think of those uh, i'd like to just kind of reiterate one of the things that that as we think about this from a, a local meats production and in fact we'll talk about uh that more so in two weeks of some of our our retail meat and our, our inventory management but one of the things and, and i know as i work with producers and, and several of us that that are on here do, and several of you are, are obviously those producers as well. Um, but like you said, in terms of weight, and so when we think about it, uh, I, I do recall even as a, in my previous world in, in beef quality assurance is that if I was ever uh, going to bet on one thing, I would say that the hot carcass weight of beef cattle will go up every year. And I would be like 18 out of 20, probably it feels like. Um, and so those carcass weights continue to increase and that part of that's from efficiencies of size, right? Um, but I think that we need to keep things into consideration. From a meat animal standpoint, hopefully on beef cattle, uh, we need at least four tenths of back fat. And we'll allow Lisa to show some pictures as well, maybe five tenths of back fat. If we can get to six tenths, uh, that's okay. Uh, once we get past 0.8 on back fat, uh, then we're probably getting a little wastier than we prefer. And uh, Lisa will be able to show us some of those. And there's some differences and some give and takes and some ag antagonistic traits, right? And so when we think about it from a beef cattle standpoint, is that when we increase that back fat thickness, we also, as they're looking at days on feed, is that we're increasing the percent of marbling, which increases our quality grade, which increases our consumer satisfaction. And so there's uh, one thing that's very, very important there from a cattle standpoint. And the CJ uh, touched on, on putting that calendar and working with people. And, and in fact, I believe that truthfully that could be a theme of any one of our five uh, uh, webinars is because if you don't have a processor that is willing to work with you, you don't have a local branded beef program, right? And because uh, you need to have some flexibility and you need to have some availability to, to get those animals in. And it's tough, right, CJ, of identifying if we have 10 head uh, to get those into the processes of plant and whether the ones that currently weigh, um, you know, even if they're long yearlings or, or something, then I'm trying to figure out when they're going to weigh 1350 um, on whatever those weights are that, that so work for you. Lisa, uh, do you have anything uh, on, on that particular CJ that you want to uh, follow up or we're going to move to Lisa if that's okay? Oh, follow up. Um no, I, yeah, I've had a call, made a call and like, we can get you in this. And then I do the math and like, those cows will be way overdone. I cannot, you know, then, then you got to go back to the drawing board or you can't, you can't buy those cattle if they're weighing 11 or something, you know? So, uh, you're, 
your targeting weights, it's some math and some guessing, but uh, I didn't really finish that up very well, but it's okay. very hard to do. That's okay. And the, the other thing is, is like, as you described that um, in terms of weights of saying, Hey, they're, they're 11 um, is that an advantage that we can have as we continue to pull our animals together is not only work on, you know, the visual evaluation of muscle and fat, just like I showed in that initial graph, but, uh, but then also knowing of, of if you have access to uh, a scale so that you can know what those weights are. And in fact, uh, you can know of whether you decide to weigh them once every two weeks or more or less so that you know that, you know what, my pen of steers are gaining 3.6 pounds. And so in another month, then they are going to be 118 pounds heavier, okay, from where they're at. And so you have a little bit of an idea there from a scale. The other thing that I would say here uh, before we push into some of that live evaluation that Lisa's going to talk about is that breed composition and frame size and truthfully muscularity are all certainly things that you would want to keep into consideration. And as we think about it from uh, cattle, there's differences on breed composition of when those are going to finish. We know um, CJ and Callie, the, the, the Angus and the Red Angus, uh, you know, even if they're more moderate in their frame, uh, might finish it a little bit earlier than some that are either larger framed uh, or more European and continental, such as our Limousine or Charlet or Galvy Cross cattle in comparison to, to meeting those endpoints. Uh, we'll let Daryl talk about uh, some of the, the swine breeds, but in fact, from the sheep breeds, we have the whole spectrum, okay? And so that makes it even tougher as we think about just from breeds and frame size. Lisa, I want to give you the floor to describe some of the things that you would look at and evaluate from, uh, from beef cattle when you're making that decision of, are these ready for market or are these not ready? Lisa? So thanks, Travis. I'm going to try to master technology here and we'll see if I can do this. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, two pictures. And the first one is going to be of um, what I would consider not to be slaughter ready cattle. Can you all see that? Or maybe do I need to turn my phone here? Do I need uh, that's very phone? good for me. Okay. So it works for you. Thank you. Um, so what I have learned in my life, um, not only being married to a rancher, but working with ranchers is that we tend to think of a bred heifer, which is, uh, the picture of the, the cattle on the bottom here is being fat cattle. And the reason why is because on most ranches, those are the fattest things we ever see, right, is a bred heifer. And um, so what I kind of, and I knew this, and I don't know why I, I probably didn't remember it or, you know, somehow stumbled over the fact that I did know this. But one of the things that I recalled during COVID was that many of the cattle that were going to local slaughter were probably something less in condition than a bred heifer. And so therefore they weren't meeting um, what consumers would consider to be a good eating experience. And um, so I, I thought maybe we should show some pictures of really what fat cattle look like. The, the steer up here at the top, he's what we would call as being pretty green. You know, he's a calf that would probably just be going into a feed yard. Um, I do believe that during some of that COVID stuff, when there were no meat, when there wasn't very much meat on the shelves, there was probably some of those type of cattle that were going into slaughter. And, you know, I, I only ascertain that because when um, consumers would send me pictures of the meat that they received back, um, they were very small in terms of ribeye size, very little fat. And in fact, the color is what um, the, the meat cut color was very light and that also indicated to me that they were pretty young in age and so I'll, I'll try to um, show another picture here we'll see if I'm smart enough to do this um, I am pretty old so we're pushing technology boundary so this is a photo of uh, two fat cattle uh, two what we would consider harvest ready cattle um, I think the top one there has about 46 hundredths of an inch of back fat when I looked over his carcass data. Uh, the one in the bottom, I think, is probably a little bit heavier. But you can see the differences in their amount of cover, uh, especially as CJ said, down here in the brisket, and carries that into the flank. And when you get behind these uh, cattle that are harvest ready, oftentimes they're starting to lay fat over their tail head um, and then down into their twist. Um, and that's the area between their hind legs. Um, and you can see this uh, calf down here in the bottom, the steer down here in the bottom. 
He's got some more condition. You can see that pretty plainly over his fore rib and down into his brisket. He's looking pretty blocky. And, you know, I, I guess, Travis, if you want to go back and talk about, you know, those fat thicknesses, I personally in um, our current North Dakota setting would be more concerned about people not getting cattle fat enough than getting them too fat. That would be my, my concern. So um, that's a little bit of what I have. I hope I described them well. Is that what you're kind of thinking here, Travis? It's very good, Lisa. If you want to just, you know, even leave that up as we look at those uh, descriptors, I thought you did a great job. That top steer here on our, our market ready one, so, you know, like you said, it's, that one's pretty big and, and full in its brisket. And, and we don't even see the, the one that's lower on your uh, subset of calves. We don't even see the rest of its body. Uh, but as you can see through, it's just its neck and its shoulder and its fore rib. And in fact, when you see that one kind of turn its uh, its head to the right uh, there in the in the fore rib, Lisa, uh, those folds are not its ribs, are they, Lisa? Uh, those nope, folds that, are, yeah, <laughs> those are, those are not its ribs. Like me. <laughs> when I turn my body like that, I get those same ripples of fat. And there so, you go. So so that's where you know they they'll fill that up there in that fore rib and that center part of his body and and when i think about it and again uh, we want to make this not particularly species specific but uh when i describe either of those and probably less so in beef animals as they're so big but even when we think about it from a, a pork uh, a, a pork carcass or even a, a lamb or a goat is that i like to describe uh they those that are trimmer uh, are going to have a more shapely carcass and so there's indentations uh, they're behind that shoulder and in the fore rib. And so when we think about just for me in terms of the lamb carcass is that they're shape. And so it's more like the Coke bottle and the different uh, where you can see the muscle that fills in um, with fat. And so that will fill in with fat. Uh, and what we can determine is more of a boat like shape. And so meaning that it's widest in the middle and uh, narrower on both ends. And all of those animals would kind of do that as well and kind of fill in the middle portion. And so. We have so, some Travis, I think it's Go a little ahead. bit important to remind people that, um, you know, I, I think people who go into this direct marketing stuff as a rule, not always, but as a rule, um, they go into it thinking that um, the consumer wants to buy a niche product, which maybe at the end of the day they do. But the first and foremost thing the consumer wants to pay for is something that tastes good and is tender. And it's something pretty similar to what they're used to buying in a grocery store. And I know that that's probably not what most direct marketers want to be, but you also have to remember that this is what people are used to eating. And so they want something pretty similar. And, you know, I, I get to work with some folks in the grass fed world and um, almost always the people who think that they want to have grass fed and I'm not picking on the grass fed world, but they have this vision that they can have a steer like one of these two that typically is going to be grass fed. And the reality is that those typically are not one in the same. And I, I find it interesting that the people that I help in the world of grass fed, they usually start in the ground beef market and that's kind of their niche in that grass fed market until they move on. And so the take home message, I guess I would say is, is that except for in sheep and goat, maybe um, fat tastes good and people like the taste of fat in cattle and in hogs. And so, especially in cattle here in the North, I wouldn't be too concerned about getting them too fat. Now that may come back to haunt me, Travis, but um, I, I, that's just my perception. You're, you're perfectly fine. And in fact, there's plenty of underfinished ones and you know, we all have a neighbor that uh, even whether that was a, a heifer that didn't breed and they said, OK, well, she's going to go to town. Um, and uh, the difference is that, and that's fine. Or even if it's a steer that, you know what, um, corn is expensive and oats and their concentrates are expensive. And so when we're evaluating it at eight dollar and plus bushel corn is that you have to make that decision, intentionally make that decision. Uh, that you're going to feed those animals just a little bit longer. And so that makes it a little bit tougher. Absolutely. We do yeah, have, I agree. yeah. And we, and I totally agree that, that you can be on both sides of that platform of, of where that logistics is on growth of bone and muscle and fat. 
uh, but we're aiming for that target. And in fact, again, we, we want to make sure that we can look at what we can do from a grain finished diets, but also Adam and April, before we move to our swan, I'd like to just get your little bit guys' idea because uh, you do provide um, a, a grass finished uh, product. Um, and so those are a little bit different because certainly as a smaller ruminant with the, the sheep, uh, we don't have to take them to 1300 pounds, right, Adam? So uh, at least we have some option uh, there, but I want you to just provide a little bit of your ideas is when, when is your animal, you know, potentially ready to go to, to slaughter and we'll shift it back. And, and Lisa, you can uh, quit with your screen sharing and allow Adam and April to, to have a little bit of the floor here. Thanks. Uh, yeah, kind of to back up a little bit and talk about the, the breed and, and frame yeah. size. Um, I've got, I started from, we started from a very small flock, three Katahdin, um, so hair sheep, we picked them because the fat flavor is not as pungent as a, a wool breed. Um, so we were going for the, the market of trying to get more people introduced to it on, on a less um, pungent or, or a little more tolerable, a little more palatable um, meat source. And even within the, the three that I started with, um, you can have variations. I've got one strain, one line that is much more fatty uh, finished on grass than um, a, another one, but they all came from the same original flock. So that's something we've kind of learned from being a little smaller and trying to, to sample each one directly is learning that even within the same breed standards, there are variations there to kind of pay attention to. Uh, and with pasture, how we raise them on the pasture, it, it may seem like a little bit more work into finding the right mix of grasses and forages um, and green material to get a good marbling still on them and, and get them done in an appropriate amount of time. A lot of research has been done to show that finishing on grass versus a grain, or, grain diet um, takes a little longer and you may not see all the fat content out of there. Um, but kind of like I had mentioned, it depends on how the breed uh, um, and how you're selecting with your animals. Um, also, knowing your market, I, I kind of want to bring that up um, with sheep and goats. Uh, there's a lot more of an ethnic market out there. Um, beef, chicken, general public kind of eat that up um, in their daily, weekly diets, um, where with the sheep and goats, we really kind of had to branch out a little bit to to fulfill all the orders of, of lambs that we had. Um, but then we found that the ethnic market, markets wanted um, longer finish. Um, I had some people that wanted a two-year-old weather. Um, they, they were hoping for an animal of a certain standard that they were used to that I was not understanding at all it kind of took me a little while to grasp on but once i was able to raise that animal to the standards that they liked i had constant buyers then off of that super well thank you very much and in fact like you described uh you know you can put together finishing strategies um that that help and work for you and so you know like you said uh and some people even as we think about it from an ethnic market and think of sheep and goats there just in generalities is that some people prefer weathers and some use and some intact males and some young and some old. And so uh, absolutely, particularly more as you know your consumer. Uh, and we'll talk about those in later webinars. But uh, again, thanks for, thanks for sharing there. And the other thing is, is that as we describe it from flavor profile, and Lisa did, all right, and their beef, and that's why we do national beef quality audits that, that Lisa and I have been a part of for, for a long, long time, like 20 years now, okay? And so... And in fact, in when we did it on the lamb quality audit, is that the reason that people consume lamb is because of flavor. And Adam and April, the reason that people don't consume lamb is because of flavor, right? And so knowing uh, what your demographics are and uh, if they uh, get too big of a, you know, a stronger flavor. And in fact, from a research standpoint, we're not going to cover it today, but we have the research capability to sort lamb flavor and goat flavor um, just like we would coffee of mild, medium, and bold. And so the information's there. The difference is, is that we don't have 
particular valuations, who's going to say one is more correct or deserves a different value? And so, like you said, and I appreciate there, it's it's knowing your consumer, knowing the the customers that you have um, to be able uh, to to provide that ideas. Okay. So uh, again, CJ and Callie get to tell their story on on some of their beef cattle. All right. Lisa gave us some examples of when those are ready. Adam and April gave us an alternative approach on, you know, some of the things that go into their decisions. And so I've, I've done the best I can, uh, but we can unmute Daryl Lisa's mic, see? And so the advantage is, as I said, that people enjoy uh, flavor and enjoy taste. And so you got the bonus um, because we're first off going to allow you to talk about pork, you know, ingredient meat of choice. All right. It's always pork and beans or sausage and eggs. I mean, you might not make center of the plate like lamb, but at least you're the ingredient meat of choice. Daryl, uh, what are the decisions uh, on, on the swine production to, to get them ready for harvest first off? Well, first off, I got to say bacon makes everything better. So, I mean, there's, <laughs> right? I mean, if you want to make anything else better, you put bacon in it. And if you want a real salad, you have a majority bacon with a piece of lettuce. So uh, there is that out there. Um, so, you know, it's it's been interesting. Uh, I grew up raising hogs as that was my focus all the way through high school that was my ffa project in high school and you know developing that eating quality experience has been been my focus across all the species that we do um number one the number one thing i hear is tenderness if it's tender they will make allowances for a lot of other things lacking and so that, that one comes to mind and, and that, that one gets to be tough sometimes in hogs. Um, it, it's very sp breed specific. Um, you know, we raise show pigs as a major part of our enterprise on our hogs and, and believe it or not, there's people that say, well, you don't want to eat one of them show pigs, but a show pig fed, right. Uh, can be very palatable. In fact, I have people that will not buy from me if it is not one of my show line genetics. Vice versa, I have people that won't buy from me if it isn't one of my Berkshire meat line genetics. Um, the Berkshire, I tell people and compare it, it's kind of the Angus in the pig world. Um, you know, you'll, you'll get more marbling in, in a Berkshire. Uh, the thing that we run into uh, the most is, is balancing that across the whole carcass on a hog. You want, you want that fat cover to make that pork chop tender and juicy. However, too much fat cover gives you bacon that is mostly fat with no meat. And there's not a lot of the old school, you know, the older generation out there that that's what they grew up with. The generations that we're selling to grew up with a very lean product. So there was a lot of meat in that bacon. And so we do a lot of crossbreeding with our Berkshires to meet that demand. But it gets back to uh, what the mobbies said there. You have to know your customer. We have customers on all ends of the spectrum, uh, not just in the hogs, but in the other species too. You have them on all ends of the spectrum. So you have to know your customer and get to learn your customer. And then you finish those animals for those customers. Now, that's, that's when we're selling halves or holes. We do a lot of package sales, you know, by the package that becomes a little more difficult because obviously you're taking a group, you're slaughtering them, you're processing them and you're combining packaging. So you'll end up with some variation. So to eliminate that variation is to try and keep as tight of a genetic line as you can, at least on your sire side is what we do. We have quite a bit of variation on our sow side, but we try and you know tighten that up with our sire side and keep our sire population very tight genetic wise it works for the most part but you know there's always things that don't click but that's probably our biggest challenge um is just when you go to the per package sales or buy the package sales is to keep that quality consistency it's easy for me if john orders a pig and i know john likes you know a leaner pig that's easy for me to supply him with that or if Susan orders one and Susan likes a fatter pig. That's easy for me to pick that specifically. But when I'm taking a group in, 
that might have some of those variations throughout them, then I have to start picking and choosing what pig I do what products out of. Um, of course, I do bacon out of every pig because you cannot make enough bacon for the market out there. If I could breed a pig that's 90% bacon, you know what? I would retire and just sell the technology because bacon right now is the number one seller when it comes to uh, any, any kind of pork product. And it's expensive. So Darryl, yeah, it is expensive. Uh, Daryl, I have a question for you. So if you look at a, a litter of pigs, you know, six, eight pigs out of a litter, how um, similar in time will they finish at weight? And how similar will their cuts be? If, you know, some people are looking at this, um, looking at the hog opportunities that are available and they take a litter of pigs, what can they expect, expect at the end of the day? I mean, they're all full sibs, but genetically they're not full sibs, right? Right. There's a, there can be quite a bit of genetic variation, especially when you start talking more of the heritage breeds like the Berkshires, um, the Spots, the Herefords. Uh, you, you get a little more variation in that because they haven't been the streamlined breeding for the, the larger commercial production facilities that the York, the Duroc, and the Hampshire have been. And so your, your consistency for growth curve and finishing capabilities will be a little bit buried within the litter, even more so than some of those real tight genetic lines, which is, which get, brings me back to the reason we try and keep at least the sire side as tight as we can and, and keep as little variation on the sire side of the genetics. That way that can increase our consistency from one litter to the next, just because of the sires. Um, but you still have that variation with your sows that creates a little bit of a challenge on putting a consistent uh, package out. You know, we're, we're small scale and, and most local producers that are selling local are small scale. So to put 15 pork chops in a package that someone might want and make them all look alike, like they can in the grocery store, that's picking from thousands of head that went through the processing facility that day, it gets tougher to do. But I think if the eating experience is there, that consumer is willing, like I said, that consumer is willing to forgive that one pork chop is bigger than the other one or, you know, has a little different look than the other one. As long as that tenderness and that eating experience is there, uh, we've been able to overcome that. So do you think, for example, in your Burke lines of pigs, is there a two week difference in when they're from one to the other earliest to last market ready uh, a month? What do you think you know, for, to help some folks out and think about this? Um, you'll, ha you'll have about a two to three week variation um, okay. from your top end performers in your litter to your uh, bottom end performers in your litter. Your top end performers will generally be a little fatter. They okay. just tend quicker. They, they tend to be more efficient. Uh, a little bit more cover they'll have, a little bit more genetic makeup of having a little more fat content generally will finish quicker than ones that are just a little bit leaner. Okay. Thank you. We've requested uh, some, uh, if you have uh, some questions uh, that you would like answered. In fact, we have some that were submitted earlier, uh, but I know that we've got uh, a talented group of attendees uh, that, uh, that, would uh, be willing to ask some questions. Uh, but one of the things here, and, and in fact, I'll probably point this one just a little bit at, at you, Lisa, um, back as it said, um, what, is, what is your thoughts in terms of age uh, of beef animals? And so we, we already talked about probably making sure that we get enough finish and not too much in terms of fat, um, but there's differences in terms of age. Do you have any thoughts? And I can provide some as well, but go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead. Well, you know, we would typically say that a calf should probably be somewhere in the 14 months of age, um, you know, in a commercial feed yard where they're being fed pretty hard and those would be calf feds uh, to go to slaughter. So, you know, as a rule, Travis, I think I would say 14 to 16 months here, um, you know, in a, a smaller operation. Um, on the bottom side, and, you know, I, I'll be really honest with you, I think probably some of our better beef comes out of what I would call a heiferet, 
uh, some of these uh, heifers that we targeted to be a bred heifer, but she didn't get pregnant. And so we send her on to the feed yard. I, it seems that with that little bit of maturity, um, they really lay on some fat and ice and they marble really nice. And, you know, if I personally were looking to maybe start into the local type market, that's a place that I might start. Now, I'll back that up. Um, if you are into a USDA inspected, sometimes they'll throw the red flag because they'll mature out to look like they're old animals and not young. Um, but as a rule, that hasn't been a huge issue. Um, but I, I think that they provide a nice opportunity. And then you balance that out, Travis, you know, based upon, um, as CJ said, kind of the, the type and frame. So, you know, we look at, if you're wanting to do this on a pretty regular basis, you're going to probably need to figure out how to get some cattle into the market in the fall. And, you know, that's the challenge in our beef industry today on a, the national scale is that we have out, I don't know, 75, 80% of our cow herd in the spring in this country. And so we're always looking for a balanced um, fat cattle supply. And if I imagine that's a challenge for CJ and uh, Callie, to be honest with you, is balancing out their fat cattle supply for a year round harvest. And so, you know, you're maybe going to have to look at some of that yearling market and you know, kind of spread them out. And so, of course, you're going to get into a little older cattle, but uh, historically speaking, those cattle tend to marble a little better. Um, so um, I guess the short story of your question, which I made really long, is, you know, on the bottom side, I would say somewhere around in that 16-month range to probably, you know, two years or so on the top end, maybe a little less, 18 months, somewhere in that realm. Thank you, Lisa. And in fact, uh, what, what I think is also important, particularly on beef cattle, and I know a lot of our uh, cash receipts and just in generalities, a lot of the decisions that we make are still beef cattle centric. Uh, but one of the things that we don't want to go over is 30 months of age, Lisa. Um, and so um, those that are over 30 months of age uh, are considered old when they are at that harvest facility. And if you are at a well, at, a, at an inspected, if it's custom exempt, then um, then you are you own that animal as it comes in, and you own that beef when it comes out, and it says not for sale, and we mean that. Uh, if it's a state inspected plant, uh, then it can be sold within the state, and if it's USDA inspected, of course, you can sell across the borders. With those inspection, uh, is that if it's over thirty months, based on dentition or on bone, is that a lot of the times the, that you're not going to want to even market bone in T-bones. And so, so they would do boneless strips and tenderloin. Right. So it truthfully changes your whole retail inventory, uh, which is in two weeks um, for our main presentation that we'll talk to you that. CJ and Callie, you heard so, it. Hold on there, Travis. I think that there is one place that maybe we can target in some older cattle. And that place is in the ground beef market. And, you know, I... I I a little bit hesitate to say that because we're generally going to need some trim, some fat trim to go in with those cattle. They're typically far too lean to be um, processed back out. And in fact, the folks who have tried to um, work with the school lunch program here in the state have learned that kind of the hard way that, you know, this ultra lean product doesn't always uh, sell very well. And so, um, one place that if you can set up your niche to be a ground beef provider and make that work, I think that's great. I work with a, a producer in Florida. That's all he does is he sells ground beef. And, you know, he has figured out that niche and his clientele. And I think it's a pretty cool deal that they do that. Um, and so that might be a niche for somebody. But if you are going to sell whole muscle cuts, and especially if you're going to sell steaks, they need to be out of young animals to offer the best eating experience, whether that's grass fed or whatever else, um, you know, grass fed, grain finished, it does not matter. Um, they're going to need to be out of young animals. So sorry, Travis, I just wanted to add in that okay. little piece. Thank you, Thank you Lisa. And uh, that trim, that lean trim provides us an option. In fact, if it wasn't for uh, older cows and or bulls, uh, we wouldn't have a trim enough product to make 93% lean ground beef. But uh, I'm going to segue there and CJ and Callie, if you're paying attention, and I know you were, you heard the question. So you've had a little bit of time to 
to think through it. And so truthfully, uh, in one word, uh, Lisa's question was seasonality. All right. And so we know, and, and in fact, on our sheep uh, producers, I know that we've got some and they say, you know, our product is available from July to October. And if you want to contact me in February, I apologize. And there's plenty of options to do out of season breeding in our small ruminants of sheep and goats. And of course, the, the swine can spread it out a lot more, but the, the cattle, uh, that's something you have to keep into consideration. What's the thoughts that go into your ideas and decision-making, CJ and Kelly, based on seasonality? Uh, seasonality, my answer for that is, ours is a walk-in freezer, I guess. Um, so to control that flow. Um, the other thing was like, I talked to some NDSU guys, I'm like, I don't think we should be finishing cattle in North Dakota in February either. Um, efficiently without maybe a monoslope barn it's they put weight on but versus fall that november december weight gain and the weight gain we get right now is there's no difference i mean february there's days they eat and barely drink water when it's 20 below i mean they eat good i shouldn't say that but the intakes are down on water and so you know the gain isn't there either so if you can control your sales through your freezer stuff. so then you can book some butcher dates and control or else a waiting list if you only sell a certain time of year but um i don't have the answer for feeding them you know i i think the most efficient time is spring and fall and the summer and the winter can be hard to finish cattle but well, at least I challenged you, and the correct answer uh, with that one, CJ, is I also knew it was a question, and so I built my own answer, right? Uh, and it was the walk-in freezer. So that's perfectly fine when you discuss it. And, and in fact, it's probably even more correct. One of the things, you know, as I describe it, and, you know, all of our proteins, and I think of it at the grocery store, is that people want to know that they have a fresh product there, Right. Um, but when we decide that we want to provide a local food product, um, a local meat, uh, is that there can be some acceptability is that when we tell that story, like Adam and April would, is that, you know, if you want a lamb, then these are the times. And particularly, right, Adam and April on the chickens that we'll talk about in, in five weeks or on the last week, there is that those aren't available all the time, right? And as we think about that, um, just in terms of our inventory, we've done some work at, at NDSU, in fact, on, on some of our lamb. And for the most part, uh, you know, there's, there's negligible differences, right? And so, uh, and when you can do that and have an impact, certainly when we know uh, of how that growth curve is changing, CJ and Callie, that we don't want them to, to not get enough fat and we don't want them to be too fat. And so knowing that, we can just get them harvested at the appropriate time uh, allows us that flexibility, okay? And so again, that's at least an option. Daryl, we have, uh, again, we're aiming for that market pig, uh, but do you ever, uh, from even a, from a, a cold sow standpoint, is that something that you keep into consideration or do you pass those onto the commercial system? No, we are, we are using our cold sows now also. Um, the only thing we don't use as of yet, we're experimenting, is our cull bores. Um, and where we're experimenting is to make a pepperoni product that, uh, you know, people can buy and easily use. And let's face it, if you eat pepperoni pizza, that's what you're eating. You're eating uh, cull bores and, and maybe some sows mixed in there because of the demand for it. But that's predominantly where the cull boars go. But we do use our cull sows. We put them on feed. Um, we try and get a finish on them. Uh, we don't just take them off of just weaning a litter. Uh, we make sure that they go on feed. They go on the same feed regiment that we would put our uh, normal aged barrows or gilts that we're finishing out for, for market. And we don't use the cuts. We use them in sausage products. Um, very, very good quality for sausage products. And, and it's a way for us to use and not have to go to the sale barn with virtually anything from here. And it's, uh, you know, it's now there's certain instances where we wouldn't, um, I got a little bit higher standards than a lot of people when it comes to 
they're butcher animals maybe that uh, some people you know you, you hear the story of uh people you know butchering just basically anything that was limping around the yard instead of the premium one well i like to eat the premium one so i like to provide the premium ones for my customers also and you know but there's there's premium abilities from some of these cull type animals it's just you use them in different ways um we don't sell pork chops out of them uh, unless it's a smoked pork chop we'll do it we'll do a smoked pork chop special once in a while if it's a younger sow um maybe first litter things didn't work out so we're going to color uh we put her on feed and we'll, we'll do smoked pork chops out of her which very good quality um tender yet we can get them again no uh no taint no coarseness in the meat of what an older sow would have of for coarseness so there's there's times we can and and upsell that carcass but there's times that we just focus and use that uh and, and use that across our other species too um we'll make lamb brats and sausages we'll use our cull sows as the pork base for that sometimes um you know, we'll make mixed beef sticks. Uh, we'll use some pork and, and beef mixed together to make some mixed beef sticks. We'll use some of that there. Um, so I think there's there's opportunity there uh, to look across the whole board. But again, you, you have to have the market for that. You have to have people that are wanting to buy those products readily because now you're getting away from the ability to sell a half or a whole when you start using those cull animals you're pretty much pushing them one direction for specialty products. And that's that that becomes a challenge to build that whole nother market above and beyond the retail cut market. Absolutely. Thank you, Daryl. Um, and again, I'd like to uh, let you guys know if you kindly would of, of putting in either your question in the chat box or in fact, um, we with our, our setting that we have, we can uh, you can push unmute to, or we can allow you to if you want to, to ask that question verbally to any of our panelists. But uh, feel free to to provide those, and hopefully our our colleagues and panelists will provide some thought uh, so that you can uh, identify some inspiring questions. Adam and and April, there when when we talk about uh, uh, seasonality. In fact, a question I'm going to lead that in with as well uh, that you kind of. At, or, or at least touched on uh, is that I received a, a question in there on, in relation to age on sheep. And so we talked about it more so. We, we challenged Daryl with uh, the age on the swine and, and truthfully allows you to repurpose them. Um, and then also on the beef cattle, we address that of at least getting them, you know, up to 14 to 18 months, but truthfully not over 30 at the very uh, standpoint. Again, from a flavor profile, um, uh, we have an advantage in both sheep and goats. And, and Daryl is absolutely correct from a consumer standpoint that tenderness is the first thing. And one of the descriptions that just to, to echo what Daryl said is that if you ever go to uh, the grocery store, even out of your own, and you get an eye of round steak, all right? So CJ and Callie, you know what the eye of round looks like. It, at least it can be visually uh, confused with the tenderloin, uh, which would be absolutely wrong. All right. And so if you decide that you're going to make an eye of round steak, uh, it doesn't matter how great the beef flavor was. Okay. Because it's going to be tough and it's going to provide a challenge in terms of your eating experience. And so, um, that, the tenderness is important when we think about it again, my question was actually posed to me as, is age of lambs. And we did some research uh, just in comparison of age. And in fact, age is one of those contributors. And one of the reasons that age becomes a factor from a meat science approach is that there's greater cross-linking of muscle fibers and there's increases in collagen, which is way too much of a, a meat sciences approach to say older animals get tougher. All right. And so that's going to happen uh, across the board. The difference is, is that there is also from a flavor profile standpoint, most commonly in an intensity of flavor. Uh, and particularly, as Daryl said, on sows, uh, the answer is yes. And on boars, it's absolutely. Uh, on cows and bulls, not maybe as much. Um, but then in sheep and goats, uh, Adam and April, we can know that the older those get, the more stronger the flavor is. And so Adam and April uh, there, just in terms of the, the age of, uh, again, sheep and goats, 
Um, but primarily the reason that you want those older ones or the consumer does is because that's what they're expecting. Would that be an appropriate answer, Adam, when we describe when is that animal ready for harvest? Uh, yeah. Um, so in sheep industry, anything over a year all of a sudden gets classified as mutton normally. And, and years ago, mutton carried with it a very strong flavor profile, um, and a, an idea that mutton was going to be very tough, had to be slow cooked, um, and would be very strong uh, in the household, spelling it and, and in the flavor. Um, so we try to keep it under that uh, 12 months, but really tickling that 11 months finishing age just to still be, um, for the consumer's knowledge, as a lamb, but as full of an, a meat product as possible. Chops are um, in the picture, I believe Travis, you had at the very beginning that looked like a lamb to me. Um, they, they were very small, two bites and, and you're done with the chop. Uh, and on that note as well, um, finding the processors that are us when we do select cuts and package cuts, making sure that the, the chops are all uniform and the same. Uh, because sometimes we can have a blade chop um, be a, in line with uh, a regular chop, lamb chop, um, but th the appearance of it, when the customer opens it up, it's a little more butterfly laid out, got a little extra fat here and there in it, um, and, and that may be off-putting to them. So making sure that you have that uniform um, cut and size when you, when you are doing that direct consumer and select cuts, uh, it is a bigger issue. Um, we do, like I mentioned, we do have some customers that specifically asked for uh, a larger frame, large, longer, older animal. Um, they, they weren't afraid of uh, the flavor profile as much, um, had been experienced more mutton flavors and everything. And, and uh, we're looking for that product. Um, so trying to, to balance, do I, I hold it over for another year. Am I feeding it? Am I, am I finishing it on grass in the spring? When, when am I going to lamb to have that 11 month old ready to go to butcher product? Um, and at what time will it be going in? CJ touched on it, walk-in freezer or freezers. Um, when I started in 2019, I must've had a dozen producers tell me invest in freezers, in freezer space, just to be able to have that right product ready to go uh, when the customer wants it. Um, Travis, you had mentioned some producers only have lamb from June to October. Um, and, and that's fine. Uh, um, but if you're looking to spread it out throughout a year and rather than rush it in, uh, knowing you've got the space to hold it, the good quality product, um, and it's all uniform. Outstanding. Thank you for that, uh, that information. Uh, we had a question come in as well, uh, and I think this one's a great one to touch on. Um, again, we could talk about these at, at later webinars if we wish, but uh, the question comes in on USDA quality grading. And in fact, uh, you know, truthfully, it's, it's USDA yield grading as well and says, can someone sell their beef um, as, as choice? Uh, for example, and so big picture right now, um, and I'm, I'm going to dig through at least all four of our species there, uh, and I'm going to start with pork, is that truthfully pork is not quality graded, all right, and so Daryl, what, uh, what, and this is this is going to the back end, but if I'm going to purchase a pork chop and I have a choice between them, I'm always picking, since I know that there's some meat scientists on here as well, I'm always picking the darkest colored one um, that also has uh, some marbling with it, because that darker color provides um, an increase in water holding capacity. And so hopefully it's juicier as well. Um, but that's, that's what I use as quality grading system. When we think about it from goats, uh, most of the goat separation of, from a meat science standpoint is lean to bone. There's not much difference in terms of eating satisfaction. And so it's which ones have more muscle. From a lamb standpoint, most lamb carcasses are either prime and choice of which case uh, 93 to 95% of those are choice. Uh, and there's not a value differentiation and there's very little difference in eating satisfaction. So that brought me back to the, um, the long way around to talk about beef cattle 
yield and quality grading. And yield grading uh, is simply the amount of retail cuts. And so it's cutability of lean to fat ratio, the amount of meat that we're going to have on that plate in relation to the amount of fat and or bone. Let's dig into back to quality grading. And so the top of the quality grading of USDA is prime. Okay. And so if, of there, there's low uh, average and high prime. Below that, there is a choice and there is high choice, average choice, and low choice. To give you an evaluation is that the average choice and high choice would be ones that in generalities um, are what it requires to be certified Angus beef. If you see just the choice, most commonly it would be the low choice. And then below that is USDA select. So there's high select and low select and truthfully below the select, uh, it's not gonna get a label, okay? It's gonna be standard or utility or coal, okay? And so, um, or utility or commercial, excuse me. Um, but uh, those uh, are gonna be in the, in the retail cho store choice, you know, upper two thirds choice or prime. That was a long way to say, is that an option for uh, the, the packing plants? USDA inspection, and this is, this is an important segregation, USDA inspection or state inspection is something uh, that you can have, which is different, like we said, than custom exempt, okay? And so those are provided um, by the state or by the USDA. In order to have USDA quality and yield grading is that that processing plant has to pay for those services, okay? And so um, like, uh, I guess, a closer in terms of a commercial plant is that there's, of course, a beef cattle plant in Aberdeen, South Dakota, that harvests enough that, uh, that they have, they pay for the USDA graders to be there. Most commonly uh, in North Dakota, uh, we wouldn't want to pay or don't pay the USDA for a yield or quality uh, grade designation uh, because we don't really use it as marketing, uh, in my standpoint. What I would suggest. Uh, from, for those individuals that want to have that as a designation is that you can purchase marbling cards, okay? And so there are USDA marbling cards that are available from the American Meat Science Association um, that, and they can find those. And then you can have those visual images on the card and you can put it next to it and say, well, this one would have been uh, if it was a young animal, select or choice or high choice, um, and, and we can have that as an option. The other thing is, is that even when we think about it from marbling, uh, is that now, and I, tonight's not the night to dig on it 100%, but there's more people that are, are could, using Wagyu semen, okay, or Akaushi semen and getting highest end, all right? And CJ and Callie, we thought we were raising the highest ones. Well, there's some people uh, that, are, that are even living on the edge. Now, when you do that, you go most commonly from a quality graded standpoint higher than some of our USDA prime designations. But a lot of the times, and in fact, I saw a bunch of those cattle uh, this winter, uh, those don't make it to harvest until 24, 26, 28 months, 30 months of age. And so there's a huge loss in terms of efficiencies of our product to get to that standpoint. And so I am unaware of any particular plants um, in the state of North Dakota that utilizes USDA yield and quality grading for cattle, um, unless uh, Mr. Lease tells me any different. Daryl, are you aware of anybody that uses USDA yield and quality grading for cattle? So there is not a quality. Now there's, there's a couple people that are qualified in the state to do it, but there is no one on a plant side of things or a marketer such as we are that are, like you said, willing to pay for it at this point. Um, it's those things become not cheap to do. Uh, I don't know that they're necessary to do when you're talking a local product, when you're talking a, product, if you're making a one-to-one -one contact with a restaurant, um, or whatever it might be, they're going to test your product. They're going to like it or they're not going to like it. Um, and, and they're going to say, yes, that meets our standards. And, and again, I'll stress again, the number one thing that they look at that we have in this situation 
when I take a product in for a new restaurant or a steakhouse to try is, is it tender? And if it passes the tenderness, they will generally make a deal. If you can come to terms on price based on that tenderness, they don't really care if it's a prime. They don't really care if it's a choice. Quite honestly, they don't care if it's a select, if you can meet the tenderness part of it. Because 99% of those places, the consumer doesn't see it till it's cooked. That's right. And therefore, it, you only have to appeal to the one in charge of buying or the chef that's in charge of cooking, whatever it may be. And, and so to go through that expense, we've talked about it in our plant. I've talked about it with our manager. He goes, yeah, we can do it. But do you want the added expense? And then you have, you have added labeling responsibilities then too, I might add. Everything that you put on your label, now you become liable for. And so you want to keep your label as clean as you possibly can to reduce your responsibilities for your label at the same time. Absolutely. And it's consistency of our products, right? And so uh, Daryl touched on, on tenderness. And, and uh, as a meat scientist uh, there, Daryl, you only forgot uh, juiciness and flavor. So it's a, you know, a three-pronged uh, crown, but that's okay. Uh, I, again, I, I echo that the tenderness is first. Uh, CJ and Callie, what are your thoughts on Travis, that? Just one question here, or one statement. And um, I think this plays back a little bit to the COVID times, but I still see it coming. Somebody will advertise on Facebook that they are selling this product or this product out of this animal, and they have a picture of a beautiful USDA prime steak. And I can't help but oftentimes think that that is false advertising. And so I think that that's how people get um, duped into these bad eating experiences, you know, is that they think they're getting this, but they really get this. And I'm not saying that marbling is the end all be all, but in the beef industry, um, marbling forgives a lot of other sins. It's a great halo effect um, attribute because it provides some juiciness and it provides flavor and it halos into that tenderness thing. And so I, I would really encourage those who are getting started in this to think about that advertising. You don't want to be that person that said, oh, we are going to get this beautiful, well-marbled steak. And we ended up with this thing that looks like an eye around out of an old bull, right? I mean, right. You, you don't want to be that guy. And so, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think this some of this um, quality grade discussion merits a little bit of that as well. Sure, and truth in terms of uh, retail labeling, and as Daryl said, consistency of our product. And and CJ, again, uh, this isn't everything that we're going to accomplish in terms of labeling. But go ahead, CJ and Callie. I think yeah, you would price your your profit out of your product if you had to hire an individual inspector to come up and label, unless you were getting a very good premium super specific but um i guess uh i could round this about like when you're finishing and feeding cattle um we were looking at i mean the first year we did 120 and we were averaging a good 40 something the last two years and uh you're looking at these bigger cattle and they're coming in overdone especially during covid and then and nobody had one complaint they love the meat probably buying a little extra fat but they like the marbling um, sent a steer pretty similar to the county fair my daughter showed a steer and uh, we we won the rate again pretty proud of that one but when we went to the steer merit in the carcass data we got dinged for you know some back fat which lower our, our uh, yield grade you know so then on the cab the certified angus beef you lost 20 bucks 100 and this and that so um, it was kind of a fine line of of you thought you were doing a good thing. Customers liked it, but in this certain parameter, you didn't fit and you lost money. But um, the guy that we get our cow killed through, they send Wagyu. And uh, yeah, they're fed for 300 days plus hard. And I asked him, like, is that very efficient? You know, I thought they were a, a carcass that marbled faster, not 
just it takes longer and they marble huge amounts but and he said i don't know i'm making money but i don't know about the farmers you know they buy them out of nebraska and then kill them up here but they have to debone them because they're pushing that 30 months age before they send them overseas so absolutely absolutely and just on that i mean i i got to to judge the wagyu's at the, at the national western stock show this past year and so those that the, that were there were 26 months of age and uh, they said, well, they got a, a little bit of time. But I also said, uh, CJ, is that I said, I probably can't afford to purchase your steer, can I? And uh, they said that their steer, once it makes it to the retail case, was worth about 13000 So somebody's making some money. Um, but, you know, they're, they're way past uh, the prime standpoint. And like you said, CJ, um, to summarize that question quickly, is that the USDA quality grade takes some to do it, and it's not something that we particularly do uh, within uh, our operation um, or our, our programs here in North Dakota. And so one of the things that I would say then, and in fact, uh, you know, I can, can echo kind of what, what Adam and, and April said in terms of just uh, the local uh, that's important as well. But Adam, do you have anything that you'd like to add to the discussion? And then we're going to wrap up uh, today's session. Um, it's really, uh, as far as I've seen with the, the sheep maintaining, um, the quality cuts in a consistent year after year basis, making sure I'm finishing same way or similar or, or better. Um, I always sample from the animal, uh, pound of ground and a cut just to do my own personal inspection. Um, I haven't been privy to being in, in the processors facility yet to see them. Um, but making sure you're maintaining uh, your quality, I guess, uh, along the lines, so. Great, great, thank you and uh, um, appreciate. I'm gonna, uh, Lisa uh, Peterson of, of joining us uh, through NDSU Extension, Adam and April, Mobby uh, Garden Dwellers Ranch and, and Daryl Lisa uh, of talking about, um, first off, uh, his swine operation and, and his expertise uh, that he has in the supply chain in our meat industry and, and CJ and Callie Thorne and talking about uh, their meats uh, programs as well. And so I, I really, really appreciate that. We do have a, another poll um, that I'm going to put up here and then hopefully I'm gonna summarize uh, just a little bit of our, our thoughts. Yes, go ahead. So while this pulls up, would all the other speakers like to talk a little bit about where their operations are? I don't know that anybody said that. Or maybe I, they did and I missed it. Um, we're in Western North Dakota, Watford City, uh, north of Dickinson, an hour and a half. Mainly cow calf operations out here, I would say. Okay, thank you. Daryl, where's home base? So we're at Douglas. Uh, we are 35 miles southwest of mine, that is where we're at. And Travis, if I could add on to one thing Lisa brought up there, she brought up the picture thing. Do not use anyone else's picture unless you want to pay about a ten dollars to $20,000 fine. Because I know of some direct sales folks in this state that have been sued and have lost by using other people's pictures. So not only are you maybe misrepresenting what your product actually is, you are violating someone else's, not necessarily a trademark on the picture, but if you go to someone else's website and take it off that the website doesn't specifically say you are free to utilize, you may get a phone call from their attorney going, um, now you're going to pay us. So the, just, just the, it goes into that whole label and truth and thing that you can get yourself in trouble in a hurry. Well, we're going to talk about truth and labeling, uh, at a different standpoint and I appreciate you, Daryl, at least providing that guidance and Appreciate CJ and Callie again for, for making meat uh, for our consumers. And I know CJ and Callie there, like you just said, uh, as we got past coronavirus 19, uh, you know, everybody had already loaded up on toilet paper and everybody had beef that they wanted to purchase from the store, but not everybody had a freezer to put it in. Okay. And so that, that's uh, changed as well a little bit. And just from a supply chain, Adam, uh, thanks. And, and where's home base for you, Adam, in April? Uh, we're up at the Botno area, um, so north of Rugby, east of Minot a little bit. 
Good, good. Thank you. And I appreciate uh, all of our panelists. Uh, a couple of things here as we just kind of pull this um, portion together is, again, we will be hosting these um, each Tuesday for the month of May. And in fact, our next one, we will look more so at direct to farmers markets and to schools. But I want to summarize a couple of things uh, that seem to be trends as well. And first off, uh, that's eating satisfaction. And when we do this uh, in terms of local foods and providing that eating satisfaction of tenderness, juiciness, and flavor is of utmost importance because that's what gets our consumers uh, to come back. The other thing is, is that when we talked about getting livestock ready for harvest, uh, which today's seminar or webinar was based on, is that consistency is extremely important. Okay, and if we're gonna provide a consistent product, that's gonna allow us the chance to market that either directly to consumers through retail um, or at a farmer's market or even working with a grocery chain or to make that connection with our restaurant tours and food service. And so consistency uh, is also extremely important. And then identifying our target and whatever that target is, big picture of whether that target is weight driven of what weights uh, suit where we need to be, as you saw on our initial graph, that had bone, muscle, and fat, whether that target is based on muscularity or if it's based on finish. And of course, uh, again, uh, big picture there, uh, just in generalities, and, and Daryl knows this, but pork fat, good, all right? Beef fat, good. Lamb fat, not good, okay? Goat fat, probably not good as well, okay? And so making those decisions is that trim muscular lambs and goats, is a little bit different than an end product on our beef cattle and importantly than a balance of bacon and lean retail yield. And so it's a big uh, switch and transition from combining meat yield and quality, uh, but those are both of the decisions. So when it's about weight and then when it's about yield and when it's about quality, all of those are decisions that have an impact on providing and getting our livestock ready for harvest. And so again, thank you to our panelists um, and thank you to those of us that joined. Um, this is a small part of North Dakota State University Extension and our small farms team of pulling the, together a webinar on local meat production and our farm to market webinar series. So this is the first of five uh, within our webinar series uh, here in May of 2022. So thanks so much again for everyone joining us and have a glorious Tuesday evening here. Uh, and uh, as we get to May in North Dakota, you know, spring is either here right around the corner and summer will be here and we can always wish for some green grass and just a little bit of sun to, to dry out to at least some of those corners, but looking for moisture as well. So it's certainly a balance as it is in raising local foods. Thanks so much and uh, enjoy your evening. Mm -hmm.